Welcome to HortTube. My name is Jim Putnam. This is a video with nothing but mid-size evergreen shrubs. Those are going to be shrubs that you can keep somewhere between four and eight feet in height. And again, uh, all evergreen, so they're going to hold their foliage through the winter time. There are videos on the channel for compact plants. There's one additional video for mid-size plants, uh, the whole different list and a couple for large plants as well and we're going to steph and i are going to continue to add to those uh in time as we find uh new or interesting things to film along the way the first plant in this video is going to be florida sunshine elysium we have several elysium in the landscape here florida sunshine is obviously uh has gold foliage and it's like this year round uh again evergreen has fragrant foliage it's very deer resistant I've seen this plant as tall as eight feet in height. In fact, uh, the one at Plant Delights, I think Tony Avent was the one who found this plant. Uh, his is about eight feet in height and maybe five or six feet in width. Would be super easy for me to keep this thing three to four feet forever uh, in, the, in this space. I could prune it that height as long as I wanted to. Uh, if I just kind of let it naturally grow here over the next three, four years, it'll be in that four to five foot range. Uh, part shade is best uh, on this plant. Uh, the, out in the full sun, it does scorch a bit. Uh, the, this spot right here is getting lots and lots of direct sun until probably 1, 1.30 in the afternoon, and then it's going into the shade, and it's very, very happy in this space. Next up is one of my favorite Elysium. Uh, this is Woodland Ruby. Uh, I grew this one for years at my nursery. It has a red flower, and it just seems to flower and flower. Uh, I, in fact, we were walking past the house just a couple days ago and commented on some that were on a foundation planting that were still flowering uh, well into September and uh, had, had been, every time we've walked by uh, during the summertime, had a, at least a few flowers on them. Great plant, very deer resistant, uh, although somebody told me recently <laughs> that there's, uh, they had some Elysium that had been eaten, but I've, I've never seen this plant uh, uh, even sampled, even sampled by a deer great for two purposes. Again, we saw them under some windows that were about four feet off the ground uh, that have stayed there for a long, long time and they can continue to prune them. So I put this, you know, as a great kind of medium sized four to six foot shrub, or it can be planted out on the border of your property somewhere and allowed to, you know, grow and fill in and, uh, and become a screening plant. Uh, not the biggest screening plant, but a screening plant in that 10 foot range, something like that. These need additional water when they're first planted. You'll see them wilt and you won't think they're very drought tolerant, but they become drought tolerant in time. Uh, it's, it's a strange plant, but they will wilt on you the first year, maybe two years. They're sun or shade um, plants, I, I, probably not full sun, but any day, any place that's getting you know, let's say, you know, eight hours or less. So not 15 hours of direct sun, but they will take a lot of sun. And then they'll go down into darker shaded spaces as well. These are being grown in quite a bit of shade and they're actually quite full. Uh, if you get in too deep a shade, you'll need to do some pruning on them to keep them full, but great, great choice uh, for, for lots of different situations in the, in the garden. I'm at Swift Creek Nursery and found the land of Akubas, uh, as Steph uh, just called it. Uh, there are lots of different varieties of variegated Akuba and many, many more that I see, we see in gardens that, are, um, that we rarely see in the nursery setting. So there probably are specialty nurseries that offer many, many more varieties uh, than what you'll find. But um, uh, Swift Creek actually has quite a few of the uh, variegated ones here. They've got the dwarf uh, gold dust and gold dust is probably the most common uh, of them. The, the, the dwarf one is still going to get four or five feet in height. It's just going to be slightly slower growing, slightly more compact. And then we have Pictorata, which I'm standing in right now, which has the, uh, the gold center in the leaf. But you'll definitely see that on gold dust Akubas, you'll occasionally get leaves where the center is, has that yellow variegation. And on Pictorata, you'll occasionally get a sport that's just speckled uh, like gold dust. Uh, Marmorata I've covered before on the Garden Plants with Jim Putnam channel. It is a very bright, showy uh, yellow. Uh, uh, it's, almost, it's almost yellow with green spots rather than green with yellow spots. Um, there's another one over here called Limbata that's super, super showy and really can probably the standout um, brightest one in the group. All of these can be held between four and six feet in height, um, probably regular 
gold dust Akuba. I've seen as big as eight feet, um, but most people are keeping them down between you know three and six feet, something like that. There's absolutely no better broadleaf evergreen uh, for shade conditions and even deep shade conditions. Once established, they can compete with the roots of your existing trees. Again, if you're planting in those kind of spaces, the trees will try to kill them, try to kill them the first year or two. So uh, you'll have to do some additional watering on them. But once they're settled in, they do not like wet feet. So mound them up a bit when you plant them and uh, make sure um, you're watering them. <laughs> and and you, that way you can water them successfully. If you planted them flush or planted them too deep or plant them in a wet area, they're going, they, they could potentially get root rot. If they're mounded up, then you can water them when they need water and not worry uh, that you're drowning them. We came across a fairly new crop of variegated gardenias. This is Gardenia jasminoides variegata. Uh, this is basically the variegated August Beauty gardenia. So if you're familiar with August Beauty, August Beauty can get four, five, six feet tall. Eventually, of course, the variegated one will be slightly slower growing than that. I've grown this plant for, I grew this plant for a long, long time. Uh, it's a great showy plant in a park shade space. You can't put this one out in full sun because this variegation uh, will will fry on it uh, if it's out in the full sun. It can take it can take some direct sun, but just not, you know, not all day. Uh, part shade is ideal, mounded up a bit so it drains well. This plant is not the most, uh, uh, it's not the biggest flower of the gardenias. You will get flowers on it, but I definitely had less flowering on variegata than I had on just the straight green uh, August Beauty or any of the others uh, as well. And that's true even with the dwarf variegated radicans. The, the, it, it blooms, but it doesn't bloom as um, prolifically as the regular radicans. So there is something different about that. The, the flowers that are on it are just as fragrant as any other gardenia. But this one you're really purchasing for this really, really bright uh, variegation in a part shade or shaded spot. Here's a Pieris called Temple Bells. Uh, this is a white flowering one. Uh, these are one of the big kickoffs to spring. It's one of the earliest flowering woody ornamental shrubs. It's uh, a great evergreen plant and when it it had you know these almost like tassel like clusters of flowers open up in the uh, late winter uh, early spring and they're lightly fragrant uh, it just gets absolutely covered in these bell-shaped flowers and then uh, after the flowering is finished all the new growth that comes out on it has this maroon coloration again shooting this in September so it doesn't have any of that color uh, to show you right now but this plant uh, even after it finishes flowering that spring flush is almost just as beautiful uh, as the flowering really easy shade evergreen plant um, pretty drought tolerant once it's established but initially it needs some extra water somewhat um, uh, susceptible to root rot so make sure you mound it up a bit when you plant it some of our shady spaces can stay a little wetter sometimes than we think but really an easy easy plant to get some uh, color really before almost anything else will be blooming in your shady space. Here's a variegated osmanthus. Uh, this one's similar to Goshiki osmanthus. I've shown Goshiki many times. Uh, Goshiki though stays much more compact uh, kind of on its own. Uh, this regular variegata here can end up you know eight to ten feet easily but can be kept kept smaller than that without any problem. Uh, just a great st very stable variegation uh, disease, um, insect free, uh, gets fragrant flowers along the stems uh, during kind of off-season time of year in, in, in October, November, and then again in kind of March and April is when it flowers, very fragrant flowers. This is a great pop of color in a park shade space, and this plant will take pretty much full sun a as well. But I don't think I've ever covered just the regular variegated um, osmanthus right here, which is just very, very striking. Here's another euonymus called Silver King. Uh, this one has a very, uh, it's not fastidious. I mean, it is upright, but it's not super narrow, but it does have an overall upright habit. I've seen this one as tall as 10, even 12 feet in height and only be three feet wide if it was never pruned. So that's the kind of growth habit it would take naturally. Most people prune these off and keep them much smaller than that. And the, you know, I'll see them four or five feet uh, in height. It is very susceptible to euonymus scale. It's Pick an open spot uh, so the, the you know air, so it has good air circulation across it. That'll keep the powdery mildew down and the and, and likely lessen the amount of problems you have. You you want them to scale and then mound it up when you plant it. That'd be my suggestions if you're drawn to Silver King. You want them. Here's a group of skip laurels. 
Uh, this one is a little more upright than what you would see with like auto lucan laurel. Auto lucan grows like almost a kind of a bird's nest shape to it. And uh, you know, it can be kept down around three feet or kind of up to six feet. Skip laurels, I would probably start at six feet uh, where you can maintain them at that height. And then I've seen these quite big, you know, over as much as 12 feet, but you don't have to let them, you don't have to let them get that big. I have white, um, but white flowers on them in the spring that are very, very showy, but not really grown for that. It's really being grown for this dark green, lustrous foliage, which is great in the uh, park shade or shade conditions. These are hardy. These laurels are hardy in zone six to nine. And I would imagine as you get up into zone six, you can put them in a lot more sun. As you get further south, um, they definitely are park shade or shade. Shrubs, they don't like wet feet. So mound them up a bit when you plant them, make sure you're not, um, um, over watering them, but do, you know, monitor them. You know, if you're planting them, especially like in dry shade conditions, like if I was planting them in these established pines, which would be a great place for them to grow, as you can see in these containers, uh, high shade, so they're getting bright light under here. But if I was planting them in the ground here, these established roots on these pine trees would be a bit greedy. So, um, you know, I need to keep an eye on them for a while, make sure that I'm uh, watering them when they need water. Once they're established though, they're, they're quite drought tolerant and can compete just fine with established trees. Early wonder camellia. Uh, this is a camellia japonica that's just very, very interesting because it actually blooms in the fall. Most camellia japonicas bloom in February, March, April, you know, after they get some cold on them during the winter time. They do carry their flower buds you know, through the winter and then open at that time. This one will actually start opening flowers at the same time the Camellia sasanquas bloom in the fall and then just continue to bloom anytime it has warm, uh, warm days from then right on through March and April. Uh, we had flowers on this thing for almost six months last year. Uh, really amazing, uh, d formal double flower, uh, beautiful, beautiful pink. This one is listed six to eight feet uh, on the tag. It's a Camellia japonica that has an upright habit. Almost certainly it's going to probably blow through 10 feet if you let it. So it can go in a large area or could be maintained uh, more in the uh, you know under eight foot size in that mid-size category. Next up is Mountain Snow Pieris. This is a great compact evergreen shrub. Gets beautiful new burgundy red foliage throughout the growing season. I'm filming this in September, so it doesn't have any of that right now. It's kind of finished growing for the season, but it has set its flower buds uh, on the tips here. And this is, this is one of the earliest flowering shrubs in the landscape. These can bloom as early as, uh, you know, late February here in my area. Depends on if we get a few warm nights. If it kind of stays cold a little longer, uh, it, it will hold off a little longer than that. But it has these little white drooped flowers in large clusters, and it becomes almost solid white. Uh, if you're following along with the channel, you can see this thing uh, toward the end of February in full flower, uh, or follow me over on Instagram. That'd be a place that I would put a pit photo of this. Uh, this is a shade uh, plant for sure, part shade to shade. It, uh, it would prefer not to be in a very, very wet space. These, these are kind of susceptible to, uh, to root rot. Uh, but I've got where we have it back here on this back line. It's almost too dry. It's a very sandy spot in our landscape and there's some trees behind it. Uh, it's kind of the perfect spot, spot for the sun shade because it gets some direct sun on it in the morning and then it goes into the shade for the afternoon. That's kind of perfect, but it would probably prefer a little more moisture than it's getting back here. And uh, that's yellowed some leaves on it this summer on the interior. If you saw that yellowing on the middle, that's what it is. It's being slightly underwatered, but I'd rather underwater it than overwater a Pieris, but this is a fantastic evergreen shrub. And this one was actually picked for heat tolerance. Pieris are not known for being great Southern plants. And this variety was picked for just that purpose. Next up is a really terrific mid-size growing evergreen shrub. This one is called, this Elysium is called Miss Scarlet. This is a, an Elysium Floridanum. This was at a chance seedling. Uh, at a uh, friend's nursery down in Florida. Uh, he, what he noticed was all the flowers were kind of on the outside of it. And that's kind of unusual in Elysium. Most of the time, the flowers are kind of down in the middle a bit. They're showy, but you can't, you, you know, it doesn't wear them on the outside. So this one is really, really particularly showy. The other thing that's interesting about it is look at this. It hasn't been pruned at all. Uh, I've got Elysium floridanum in, the, in a video for large growing shrubs because normally they're very upright. 
a little bit looser formed than this and they just take off growing north. Uh, this one is, has got this compact habit without us having have done anything to it uh, whatsoever. It's got a slightly different uh, shaped leaf. The leaf is a little more pointy on the, uh, the regular, uh, the straight species uh, Floridanum. Uh, just an interesting, so interesting plant. This one's listed four to six feet uh, on, the, uh, on the tag. And I think with this round habit and this kind of slow, steady growth habit like this, that's probably uh, gonna be easily kept in that range. It probably will creep up to six or eight feet uh, if you never pruned it, but you can prune it after it flowers uh, every year. But what an amazing plant. Uh, I'm super, super impressed by this and more so almost every time I look at it. Mood ring podocarpus. This thing has the perfect name. This is a podocarpus that all the new growth on it is, is starts off kind of pink and evolves through several different colors before it becomes dark green later in the growing season. Shooting this in middle September so it doesn't have much of that new growth on it, good because it's about to, it needs to be going dormant. But in the spring, it'll be absolutely covered in that pink new growth. Like other upright podocarpus like this, it'll reach 10 to 15 feet in height, but super, super narrow. Uh, so if you have a narrow, a narrow space where you're looking for something that you can screen a neighbor with, these upright podocarpus are great choices for that. Mackey's a great one, but I really like this mood ring because it does, you know, has this interesting foliage color. Uh, this one is in a little bit more shade than it would probably like, so it's tried to stretch on me a little bit. I'm going to have to do a bit of pruning on it uh, but to, to have it in this spot. This was definitely full sun or part shade, and I've got this one almost in what I would call shade, but it's stretching a bit, but it still looks great. Um, it's super interesting plant, very, very drought tolerant, a great, cho great choice in coastal areas uh, in the south, and uh, you really do see a lot of these in Charleston and Savannah and those places. Here's a group of Climbs Hardy gardenias. Uh, this one, this is a great compact growing uh, gardenia, perfect for a foundation, perfect for, you know, any, any place you need a little three to four foot round ball, because that's how this one grows. It blooms heavily in the spring, and then this one has always had, you know, the ability to continue to, you know, throw on some throw on some more flowers the rest of the season. So, despite the fact that the flowers are single, it makes up for it in the number of flowers you're going to have over the course of the year. Of course, they're extremely fragrant. I could also put this plant into the into a video of kind of mid-sized shrubs because I've seen this one as tall as head high in the landscape. So, you know, keep that in mind. I'm, you know, this is maintainable between three and four feet, but if, you know, if you've got a spot where you can use something that's five or six feet, this will also work. This is Yuletide Camellia. This is a Camellia Sasanqua fall blooming. Uh, this one will start blooming as early as October, but more likely late October, and then it'll bloom November, December, and if there's any residual buds on it, they can bloom after the uh, first of the year. This one typically has a pretty good upright habit. Um, it will get wide, but more upright um, than wide. I'm putting this, you know, the video you're watching is plants that can be maintained between, you know, four and eight feet in height, something like that. Eventually this would get bigger than that if you never pruned it, but I had a Yuletide Camellia on my foundation for 23 years and it was about six feet uh, when I left. I had probably only pruned it like two times in that 23 years. So it's that really perfect part shade, evergreen shrub that you can keep just as a perfect little form without hardly having to do any maintenance to it. And it blooms at an, a, a time of year when you wouldn't expect it to. And it's red flowers near Christmas. How can you beat that? A lot of the breeding work in gardenias is always making them smaller and smaller and more and more compact. Uh, but one that's been around for a long time is August Beauty, and uh, it is not compact. This one gets, gets some size to it. This one typically in the landscape is going to be head high or slightly taller, maintainable, let's call it between five and eight feet, something like that. Perfect double white flowers on it, blooms heavily in kind of late spring. All of your early season flowering things will have just finished about time gardenia season starts. It's usually a few weeks later, they require slightly warmer temperatures, and then August Beauty will continue to have residual flowers as it puts on new growth uh, during the summer. Of course, extremely, extremely fragrant. Great, great dark green foliage. The new growth that comes out on it is a slightly more lime green or lighter green color, and it creates kind of a two-tone uh, growth to it, but you can see very vigorous, very vigorous gardenia.
Next up is uh, one of my absolute favorite conifers. This is a Boulevard Cypress. It's super soft to the touch. And uh, me, you know, many, many conifers uh, kind of bite you back if you do what I'm doing right here. Uh, a lot of times you'll see tags on these as small as five feet and then up to 12 feet. So, and both are accurate. You can keep this thing four or five, six feet tall if you want to with a little bit of shearing. It's slow growing, kind of considered almost a semi-dwarf uh, conifer, you know, dwarf being of something that's 50 feet tall uh, and it can get up to 12 feet tall. So I would put this in a mid-sized shrub range where you could put it on a corner and keep it, you know, lower than eight feet uh, for a long, long time or you could use it in a screen as well. Uh, they're, they're hardy in zone four to eight, and we're in zone seven B in Raleigh, North Carolina, and I see them here uh, really struggling if it gets dry and gets super, super hot. So this is a plant I'm gonna keep an eye on if you're growing it in its southern range. Uh, if it gets dry, this is one you're gonna wanna drag a water hose to and make sure you're watering it. Otherwise it does, again, like I say, get thin out at the bottom, down at the bottom. Because it's hardy in zone four to eight and I'm in zone seven B, I have it in a container and I can keep it here year round. Uh, this, this no doubt can stay in here two or three years before I have to make any decision of what I'm going to do with it. And then other things can be planted around it. But what a great, great conifer. I had boxwoods in the first compact plant video or small growing, easy to keep small shrubs. Uh, but I didn't show the variegated boxwood. Uh, this, this one has been uh, tree formed or you know limbed up into a, a little one little ball. I've got a multi-ball tree over here. You can just have these full right down to the ground, be kept any size you want to keep them. This is Buxus sempervirens uh, variegata. Make great container plants. They lend themselves to being topiaried like these have been and also just in the ground in some sort of mixed border. If you have some larger evergreen things, uh, behind it, uh, these would just pop in front of those. They can reach five feet in height, uh, maybe even a little more, but are super, super easy to keep, you know, less than 36 inches uh, as long as you want to keep them there. But what a great pop of color these are. We've shown the green Fatsia japonica. Uh, this, this one right here is a variegated one called Spider's Web. A uh, really beautiful uh, variegated form of Fatsia japonica. Uh, these have those giant palmate shaped leaves and then the variegation on this plant is all over the place the newest growth in the spring is almost white uh, and then it settles in over time into just kind of a you know a splotched uh, variegation maybe maintaining some of the variegation just on the outside edges of the leaf really beautiful because it looks like it's doing all kinds of things uh, at one time these can reach four to six maybe even eight feet in height if you let them uh, they bloom with these incredible orb-shaped uh, flowers that, that look uh, uh, looks like they came from space or something, but the pollinators absolutely love them. This is one, this is a fantastic pollinator plant. These are best in the shade, part shade or shade. Wouldn't like, wouldn't, most things with leaves this size don't really tolerate a lot of midday sun. You can almost look at a plant like this and go, that thing needs to go in, in some shade. So we have it in a protected space. Uh, it's marginally hardy here where we are in zone 7B. So again, that's another reason it's tucked up in here. Really just an easy, low maintenance, uh, interesting, tropical looking uh, evergreen shrub. Next up is a pineapple guava. This variety is called Bambina. It per has really attractive flowers on it that are kind of, uh, kind of a, a mauve color with a white edge on them. I uh, understand the flowers are actually edible, and of course it produces uh, edible fruit if you don't eat the flowers <laughs> off of it and you let them become fruit. Uh, here in zone 7B, I'm never going to see the fruit uh, on them, and uh, it's, it's a little cold here. Our season is too short, so further south, you know, it's a great fruiting plant. We are growing it because it has this incredible blue-green foliage, this incredible compact habit. It says three to four feet by three to four feet on the tag. I think it's gonna blow through that a bit. This one's already over three feet in height, and I've seen one five feet in a container. Uh, beautiful shrub. So I think it's kind of a mid-size evergreen shrub that you can keep between you know, three and six feet in height, and uh, it's got a, more, a little more of an upright habit, so I wouldn't say it's equal in width, so it's slightly narrower than that, but again, very attractive flowers, very unique uh, flowers. Uh, of course, fruit, if, it, if you're south of us, very drought tolerant, and an interesting foliage color that'll contrast nicely with other things in the landscape. So this will be the last one in this uh, mid-size evergreen shrub video. This is Marvel Mahonia. 
Uh, again, thank you guys for watching these videos. There'll be more um, uh, coming with mid-sized shrubs, compact shrubs, narrow shrubs, narrow trees. We got lots of categories uh, we're gonna cover in these videos. Marvel Mahonia is a beautiful, lustrous, dark green, shiny, evergreen shrub. This one has been in the ground for uh, about two years now. I'm six foot tall and it's a little over five. Uh, it will get this incredible cluster of yellow flowers on the top of it during the winter time that the pollinators absolutely love. It has a very vertical growth habit, as you can see, uh, five to six feet, probably max, and then three to four feet wide. It can get wider if, you, if you're top pruning it a bit. Last year, it had just one liter and I cut it back and this year it has four liters. So this year I'm gonna get four uh, grouping, la very large groupings of flowers. After it flowers this winter, I'm going to cut it again, you know, just right under the flower clusters and I'll get even more branching on it and have more flowers each year. This is a really fantastic ornamental uh, evergreen shrub for the shade uh, and it will take dry shade as well. The spot that this one is sitting in is very, very dry. It's one of the few things on this back line back here that don't scream for water all the time. It uh, anchored itself quickly and has been just kind of a no fuss plant. Thank you guys for following along with the channel and these uh, plant specific videos and there's more to come. Thanks for following along.